Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Is we're live right now. Wednesday morning. I can, I can see everybody in the chat room in their chairs right now. Idiotic just makes Wednesdays better, don't you? Ooh, we got weather reports coming in, too. Where, where's everybody? Uh, what are we seeing out there? I got rain in Scottsdale. What are you seeing, Chris? We have a bright sunny day here in eastern Ontario. Feels like spring is going to come any month now. Uh, maybe by June. <laughs> we call this pre-summer in Arizona. <laughs> spring spring passed already for us. It's 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 been in yeah, it, It's above it's above freezing here, so we call this patio season. <laughs> so, so is it 33? Oh, I think exactly. I'm with Celsius. Bing, bing. Like, so you're like yep. 2. Two degrees exactly. or something yep. like that. It's two degrees. Put the shorts <laughs> on. Get to the patios. Shorts and flip-flops weather in Canada, there we go. everybody. There we go. You gotta love it. <laughs> I mean, your, well, your, 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 your flip-flops have crampons on the bottom to, to still dig into the ice. <laughs> but, you know, I, they're least, ice spikes, right? Exactly. Like he's like golf shoes, uh, except yeah. they're flip-flops. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. Get- Boy, we have double the pleasure, double the fun with two guests today. Chris, who's hanging out with us today? Gang, we have Daryl Wiles and Nikki O'Keefe joining us, um, which is a blast. Um, this is your, I'm just sorry, I'm paused on the grammar there here. Uh, <laughs> for, for both of you, this is your first time joining us here on Idiotic. So uh, introduce yourself to our, our gang here, guys. Um, Daryl and, and then Nikki, take a round at it. Uh, well, hey, first of all, uh, both to Chris and Brent, thanks thanks for inviting us to uh, be part of the Idiot crew today. Uh, we're excited. Cool, cool. Uh, I, I'm joining I'm joining you today from Washington D.C. and I, I work for uh, the Association for Talent Development. I'm a facilitator, and uh, I've been in the talent development world for over 25 years now. And I've done it all. Uh, been a facilitator, been a manager, been a consultant. Uh, worked in banking and uh, Actually, you also worked in parks and recreation for, for a period of time. Mm. So um, I've Fine. facilitated a lot of programs. I've built training uh, programs. And I'm a new author uh, with my, mm-hmm. my colleague here, Nikki. Uh, so we're really excited uh, to meet all of you today and uh, to share a little bit about what we got going on right now with our book. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, thanks, Daryl, for kicking us off. Daryl, I was curious, though, you know, what are you drinking in your coffee mug today? <laughs> oh, oh, man. Yeah. Oh, we, oh we, matching. We, we, no, yeah, we didn't plan matching. that. Yeah, we, that. we sure okay. didn't. But uh, <laughs> I got a little cafe mocha um, infused with a little French vanilla. Uh, in it. So, uh, something Holy. Like, I I hope, uh, Chris, I hope that's to your liking. <laughs> you, you know what? So you got the mocha, you got the vanilla. If you threw some strawberry in there, you'd have like the Neapolitan ice cream of coffees, wouldn't you? I'm going to have to try that out. <laughs> At the first just keep the stripes. <laughs> you got to get the stripes working, right? <laughs> yes. That's 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 top level barista action there. I don't I don't know how that's yeah. going to work. For sure, for sure. That that that's a really um a good recipe, Daryl. I will say though, I've prefer the flavored coffee as well but now i just buy the flavored carry pods so um that's what i've jumped to and my yeah. go-to at the moment is southern southern pecan coffee so with a splash of almond milk that's that's what i like today so um i also work for the association for talent development alongside daryl and I have been with HD for almost six years now and i can't believe it it's been a great journey Um, I don't know if anyone else can relate, but maybe accidental instructional designers out there potentially. Um, I guess I can't call myself that anymore now that I've had many years of of formal (laughs) training and doing it um, alongside facilitation. And 
I think they go really well uh, hand in hand because when you facilitate, you get to kind of see what's working well with designs and what maybe doesn't work so well. And then when you're a designer, you can really make decisions um, to support those facilitators and set them up for success. So um, I love to do a little bit of it all. I appreciate the range of programs we get to facilitate at ATD and we're always up to date with the latest and greatest um, industry buzz that's out there. So hopefully we can bring some of that scoop to you all today. And um, author, yeah, I wouldn't have expected to add that to my list, but when you have a great team to work alongside with it, it makes that, um, you know, intimidation of, of <laughs> writing seem a little bit more, um, I guess, bearable when it's not your your normal go-to um, day-to-day. So it was that was a really, um, big accomplishment, I think, for for us as a team and um, my in my own personal career journey. Yeah, very cool. Um, cool. J-Rock has noted in the chat already that he has the book and then other folks are going, what's the book? So (laughs) let's uh, if we yeah, show the book. Hey, there we go. The book. (laughs) Yeah. Facilitation in action. (laughs) Yes. Your authentic training style. And yeah, we were able to uh, you know, pull it together all last year and release it. And J Rock, we're so happy that you have a copy in your hands already. You mm-hmm. gotta, you know, tell us all about it. But uh, you know, this book is is really for everyone uh, in the talent development field. Uh, whether you're a facilitator, whether you're an instructional designer, you know, if you're managing, we provide a lot of tips and lessons uh, in the book mm-hmm. uh, that come from our unique experiences. Uh, Nikki and I, we co-wrote this book with uh, two of our colleagues. Uh, uh, at ATD, Carrie Addington uh, and Jared Douglas. So the four of us, you know, we bring uh, some unique experiences uh, that we've had over the course of our career, some successes, <laughs> some failures <laughs> that we've all learned from. Um, and for our audience here today, the instructional designers, uh, what better way to get a peek into the minds uh, of different facilitators than to a book like this? So we take you on a journey and <laughs> we share some stories. Uh, and it's interactive, uh, where we mm-hmm. take the reader through activities at the end of each chapter. So, uh, mm-hmm. again, we, we would love to talk about it today. Yeah, cool. Really, how it impacts. I mean, let's let, let, let's team. start with the with the basics. Um, um, facilitation. Do you guys work from a specific, you know, either a definition or or a description of what that is, and 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 what it can do? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I think that this is talk that's gone, I know, around our office many a times is, are you a trainer? Are you a facilitator? Are you um, a coach? Are you a mentor? And sometimes it, it's tough because I don't want to bucket anyone into mm-hmm. one of those roles, but we definitely um, work through our process by thinking about, you know, how have we evolved in our craft and and what is our end goal as facilitators. And I think what we find at ATD and um, kind of our our mission and what brings us back to our decisions is maintaining that learner-centered approach, um, which lends, I think, more to facilitation than maybe being a teacher or a trainer, just kind of telling content and sharing knowledge. So um, we, I, I think, really work for those aha moments where the learners are self-discovering. Of course, in our head as designers, we have learning objectives and facilitators, we want to get them there, but how can we have the learner do it <laughs> as much as possible rather than um, us just sharing content? <laughs> what do you think, yeah. Daryl? Yeah, I, I think we we write a lot in the book about kind of the art of facilitation, and and in many instances, it's adjusting to the needs of the group that's in front of you at that moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, you you as a as a facilitator or a trainer, you may be delivering the same class over and over and over again, but do you deliver it the same way each time? And I think part of the art of facilitation is identifying what the needs of the group that you have in front of you and, and making adjustments accordingly so you can reach those aha moments like Nikki mm-hmm. just described. Um, you know, that's those are the things that we live for mm-hmm. <laughs> as facilitators. We want to see people, you know, nodding that they have understanding mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, they 
have their questions answered, but most importantly, uh, that they're taking information from that learning experience and, and really applying it because that's the reason why we're, why we're there. We want them to take what they, you know, gain and learn in the class and apply it back on the job mm -hmm. to, to effectively use it. Mm. Yep, we've got, um, uh, we've got some points we wanted to be sure to talk about today besides all of, uh, uh, of that stuff. And I'm trying to figure out a good segue and I'm failing miserably <laughs> at it. So, so let's just jump right to the doc, uh, and, uh, and check it out. But I like the first one that you mentioned setting facilitators up for success. This is interesting because, we typically just kind of let facilitators run wild and we just assume that they're going to know how to do stuff. And this is great for managers and, uh, you know, the folks that have facilitators on their team mm -hmm. and to, to help them. Tell us a little bit more about that one. It's a good one. Yeah, I think that um, as much as we work in these separate worlds you know we may have the title of instructional designer and facilitator and think they're they don't need to come together um like i said at the start it can be really valuable if you've had the chance to do both roles because your eyes are open to maybe the level of detail that needs to be given to a facilitator or vice versa like what feedback can facilitators give back to instructional designers and I use that term a lot um, when I'm giving feedback, maybe when I'm working as a, a SME on a project and it's in that design development phase of how are we going to set the facilitators up for success with this activity? For example, you're, you're stating, you know, um, break them into three groups and have them talk about this and move on and, you know, something to that degree. And I'm thinking for how much time, what are some, prompts that the facilitator should be, you know, prodding them with what is the key takeaway so that everyone ends up walking away with the intent of that activity. And um, I think it's really sometimes the small details that we as instructional designers may not think about because we're, we're not in the classroom experiencing it, um, where it can be really obvious and evident for facilitators to see those holes. So um, I think it's then having that communication of what you need from me and vice versa when those two roles are coming together to make that partnership to help, I think, really the design shine and the, the facilitator as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, 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 oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's rather... It, it would be rather hard for an instructional designer to to plan or create content if they haven't actually, you know, stood in the room and, and experienced that and understand, you know, the dynamics that are that are going to to be, um, you know, involved on that front. Um, J Rock's pointing out the industry has really changed. I don't think it's enough to be a mere instructional designer anymore. Job postings are more and more asking for the, you know, for the total package there. Um, yeah. the, you know, <laughs> and we all wear we all wear multiple hats, mm -hmm. you know, from that from that sort of, um, you know, from that perspective. But especially, I think, where where you've created something, then other people are going to be delivering it, whether you're one of the deliverers, but other, you know, other people. Um, uh, how do you move from being sort of predictive or, or prescriptive, I think, actually, is the word, mm. uh, you know, of, of what should be done to, I'm going to call it something more open or flexible that still mm -hmm. allows, you know, allows for something to be altered or adapted, et cetera, but also sticks to the, to the you know the knitting that needs to get done as well i mixed up so many metaphors <laughs> <laughs> yeah chris I, i've been jotting a few of them down here let's see if i can, can touch on a few of them uh and i think nikki alluded to a, a, in our answer in terms of you know as instructional designers uh and and, and like nikki said you know we our, our role at ATD is multifaceted. We, we do a little bit of everything um, from facilitation to instructional design to, you know, uh, learning experience. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you roll all of that together, you know, the, the, the job of the, of the instructional designer is, is you, you have to get away from your desk and you have to go out and you have to be a keen observer of everything that's 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 going on. Uh, you have to have an idea of how the learner is experiencing uh, the learning. 
um, you, know, you have, have to actually go to that, that environment and, 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 and see it in action. Um, and I, I think that's one uh, important part uh, uh, for an instructional designer to evolve and, and grow in, into their role. Uh, one of the phrases I like to use uh, as a facilitator, especially if learners really are enjoying, enjoying the learning experiences, I, I like to say I stand on the shoulders of good instructional design. And mm -hmm. when I'm able to, to say that, that phrase to folks, um, to me, it's I, I know that the, the instructional designer has done a good job of figuring out what the needs are. They know how, how participants are experiencing uh, the learning. Uh, and, you know, for me, what that looks like is, you know, an instructional designer might put in a little background info um, when I'm covering a topic, you know, to make me look good and, and, and <laughs> to make me sound like I'm, I'm well versed on the topic. Uh, they may give me some tips mm -hmm. on how to engage uh, with the audience. You know, some question prompts here and there to continue the discussion. We need that, that type of information uh, in the leader's notes uh, as facilitators, it's, it's not enough for the instructional designer to tell us how to execute an activity or exercise or, or walk mm -hmm. us through uh, the lesson. We need that background information to support us. And that makes us look good. And then in turn, it makes the instructional designer uh, look good. So yeah, definitely got to get out there and find out what those little things are uh, that have impact. I asked a question in the chat and I was actually kind of surprised. I, I, I don't think I was as clear as what I wanted to say. I said, I asked, uh, you know, who here has designed a course that someone else would facilitate mm. and boy, the thumbs up is up to 10. Mm. And I just wasn't sure if um, people did that anymore that, um, you know, I, I don't know if with cutbacks has anything to do with it or whatever, but I just assumed like J-Rock was saying that all of the roles have been kind of squashed together and that facilitators and classroom instructors had to kind of do their own instructional design, right? Had to pull their own materials together and kind of, you know, manage that whole process themselves. But the fact that so many people are, uh, are, are still, um, are still doing that is, uh, is really interesting to me. So it, it's good that we're hitting, uh, hitting a sweet spot with today's conversation. Mm. What else can they be doing to help those facilitators? I was gonna, when, when Daryl was speaking and, and talking about just some of the, the prompts that can be provided, what I think the facilitator does is bring the color to the classroom. And what, I, what do I mean by that? They bring, of course, their own stories and examples and practical application pieces to make the connections and i do find that very valuable however what i think instructional designers can do is maybe give us a head start like <laughs> um here is an example story and then if you hear something you're going oh actually that is exactly what happened in this situation that I experienced because there's sometimes when I like will read um, a facilitator guide for example and I'm thinking uh I've never experienced that and you kind of <laughs> then start to do the self-doubt and I know there's probably many folks when I was saying maybe you're an accidental you know SME to trainer and you didn't expect yeah. that and um that can be really hard to then go well what what are they wanting me to share in this moment or now I'm not confident that I have the skills to do this. So um, a lot of it comes down to maybe just getting those starting prompts. And then I think as you get ready for your facilitation, you're diving deeper going, okay, I may not have this exact situation or content experience, but even in my education, I worked on a project and I had to work with people and I can kind of share that as a story. So um, just some starting examples or stories for facilitators to kind of spring from is really beneficial. So something more than a blank box that says, insert your personal experience. Here. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes. <I'm sure. laughs> Hold on a second. Yeah, Let me take some notes and I'll go cross that out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no we're both laughing because this is something that we've both experienced before. Okay. I mean, just insert a story. Of, okay, where, yeah. where is this story going to come from? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, give me a hint. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, well, that might be a good segue then into um, my favorite thing, which is, um, you know, what is some like failures, like things that go wrong? I, I think people <laughs> learn the most from 
examples that are that have you know when things go wrong not just the person that it's happening to but others hearing those stories right like how we developed something or how we got uh you know uh, a design package and you know an instructor guide from somebody and it just went terribly wrong you know um what are uh is, do you guys have any good ones oh man i <laughs> let, let, let me jump in first on this one, Nikki. I mean, <laughs> yeah, call out I mean, I mean, hey, look, specifically I, or anything like that. We, we don't need to do no, that. That's not what I'm saying. I'll call, I, you know, just... <laughs> I'll call myself out, Brent. Let okay. me call myself out on this one. And, and yeah, I, I, I tell you, I, I think the thing that really resonates for me whenever I'm facilitating a class, I love to give <laughs> examples of where I failed um, because they're great lessons. And yeah. Um, you know, I, I can think of an example uh, working in the parks and recreation world. I was eager to, to build a learning solution that they that the agency requested and, you know, they wanted it delivered to the entire agency. So I designed a learning solution with only a limited uh, audience in mind. And the first day I delivered the class and I had a mixture of personnel from all parts of the agency in the room. I learned within five minutes that that content, that material was only appropriate for maybe 20% of the room. And, and literally when you have the looks on, on folks' faces mm -hmm. that, hey, I'm ready to leave the room. <laughs> it just doesn't resonate with me. Uh, if you can imagine a, a, a park and rec recreation agency, I had uh, you know people who worked in maintenance, people who worked in admin. I had police officers. so. You know, the topic did not resonate with everyone, and we really needed to, to build targeted solutions for each group. Uh, that was a harsh, harsh lesson to learn <laughs> as an instructional designer and facilitator. Um, I'm sure we can I, all I, relate to that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> I, I learned quickly that hey, I, I definitely took the wrong approach, um, and and it was a good lesson because now projects moving forward. I know the first question to ask is, who is my audience? Do I need to build alternate solutions to fit different uh, yeah. uh, markets within the within the audience group? Uh, and and we write about a few of those examples okay. uh, in, in in the book. So uh, I think some of our our biggest lessons are from failures that we've had, and um, you'll see some examples in the book that we wrote about that we altered approaches uh we made adjustments in the moment because you know you're you're given reality that you have in front of you you, you have to make those those type of adjustments so mm -hmm. yeah definitely Nikki, you got a good one for me yeah i mean i definitely have those experiences too where um you walk into a situation and it's not what you expect uh a lot of technology woes that now just kind yeah. of roll with like that's okay. Um, we don't have the whiteboard that you just worked 30 minutes on, but I'm sure it was a great discussion. And, you know, it's thinking through those things. So rather than um, treating it as a failure, I tried to go, how can this be a teaching moment? Of course, if it's a facilitation program, I go, team, what would you have done? I'm the facilitator. This is tough. I'm going to be honest and authentic and say, that wasn't supposed to happen. I, uh, you know, sincerely apologize, but let's try to brainstorm what we what we did come up with or what we did have. Uh, so I, I think what we talk about a lot in our our stories and our and what's true to us is remaining honest and transparent for for the learners. Um, and I think that even comes as designers too. why are we doing this initiative? What was the result of the needs assessment? And let's share that because I think once it gets to the messenger, which is sometimes us as facilitators, to say, we're implementing this change. And it's like shock to all. Those are also really big challenges um, that we see in the classroom that we're maybe not prepared for. So I always try to partner with folks on that, the why or managers get their buy-in. Can you come? Can you be here? Or can you um, help with the lead up and support this effort? Otherwise, it can be just a barrier to even start the engagement when we walk in and say, hey, we're spending three days to talk about 
this surprise, <laughs> um, that can also be something that I've um, learned. It, it just goes much smoother if I'm well prepared for that. Indeed. It, we, so here's a particular question, kind of off topic a little bit, but not too much. Um, Peter wants to know, um, let's see if I can do this. Yeah. It says, do you address um, how to manage training attendees who don't have the prereqs? So in this world of blended learning scenarios and things like that, right? You, you might give some folks an e-learning thing to take beforehand, right? To level set everybody. And then they come into the classroom or the virtual classroom. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with those folks who maybe decided to just kind of blow off the prereq stuff? I think that's what Peter was referring to. And maybe Peter can comment in the chat if I'm wrong. Uh, first of all, Peter, that's never happened to me before. <laughs> Not a thing. Not a thing. No. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wonder how to handle that. Oh, God, it, it, this happens all the time. And, and <laughs> Do you kick him out? He's like, get out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we got a class next week that you can attend. And, you know, once you get it together, no, we, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, this is one that we, we faced often as facilitators. And in chapters uh, two and three, uh, mm -hmm. in the book. We, we first talk about setting the stage and um, okay. a lot of, uh, I think when I look at chapter two, it's a really comprehensive uh, view of everything that you need to do to kind of get everybody on board with with what they need, need to do to be successful in the class. Now, we also write uh, what to do uh, and how to adapt if, they, if the learner doesn't meet that requirement. Mm -hmm. And it's a given, rea it's a reality that we all encounter because let's face it, um, when when people attend our classes, it's it's a disruption from their normal workday. And mm -hmm. you know, most people who are attending your classes, they're focused on their work, their day to day work. You know, when you when you ask them, hey, could you take twenty minutes or so to log on to a platform and, and read up on something or or read an article? You know, a, a lot of people may not have an opportunity to do that. So. You know, as facilitators, uh, one of the tips we, we have is is hey, take a take a little poll to find out where everybody is at the moment with their understanding mm -hmm. uh, of what they need to do. And, and if they don't meet that requirement, it, it's not a time for you to kind of <laughs> cast a spell on them or anything like that. And mm -hmm. it's, it's just you acknowledge it, and then you find a way to get them uh, in in line with with mm -hmm. where you need them need them to be. Uh, but that, that's uh, some of the advice we, 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 we have. But yeah, chapter two and chapter three really <laughs> covers that in extensive detail. Mm -hmm. But great question, Peter. Yeah, and I was going to say too, Daryl, some practical examples that we've lived and breathed in case anyone wants to maybe try some of these techniques because it will happen. And I'm seeing in the chat, you know, you have to plan for this. Um, what, like, let's say one of our programs, we say, let's read a case study before we come in so that we ha at least have that knowledge all in our, our heads fresh. So we don't have to spend, you know, the first 15 minutes reading it. Guess what? Half the group doesn't have the, the case study under their belt. So we'll do something like, um, go over maybe two slides of the high levels of what was in the case study and then say we still would recommend maybe during the first break or during lunch that you do take time to read but at least these high level you know um points will bring you up to speed when we go into our first discussion um, there's other instances when we may have them do like a pre-assessment of their skill level and a lot of times i'll ask how did it look team like how's your confidence with this subject matter and they'll give me the blank stares of like i have no clue what you're talking about and i'll go okay well <laughs> high level we're wanting to check in and i may just do a quick barometer what's your skill level as an instructional designer zero to five are you walking in with nothing are you walking in you know saying you could teach the class and then just bringing home what's the intent of that well i want you to think about where you're at now so by the time we leave you go up a little bit in that um, point ranking and, and that would be our hope and goal. So there's some ways that you can kind of keep them moving along. <laughs> if, I, if I may add, because I see the discussion going on in chat right now. First of all, 
Man, these suggestions that, that folks are sharing in chat, I might have to try, try a few of them out. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to try the one J-Rock mentioned, uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, grain of salt. Um, if you're reading yes. anything from J-Rock, grain of salt. <laughs> I, I think one of, one of the things Paul mentions uh, in chat uh, about, you know, how, you know, you don't want to reteach everything that that mm -hmm. was the learner's responsibility a, ahead mm -hmm. of time. You you do have to communicate what the standard is to get people to fall in in, in the line. So, so yeah, we we do do some work to get people to catch up. But at the same time, we 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 may say, hey, you know, after the session, take some time to to re read read and, and and catch up. So I I, I do want to acknowledge what Paul shared in, in chat. You don't want to. You don't want to uh, focus on it too much where it takes takes time away from the agenda you have in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think they're like folks are talking about what are the consequences or what are the um, rewards going to be like for those who do versus don't. And I think sometimes they're very natural consequences and natural rewards, because let's say you were supposed to come with um, an application on your desktop installed, ready to go. You don't have it. OK. You don't have it well we're moving forward so if you get it at lunch just know you're going to be walking in you can sit and observe like i let the learner then decide is this going to be worth their time in the here and now um same with a uh, one of our programs they they have to do like a, a practice facilitation you're going to come in knowing what you're going to facilitate at the end of the day guess what if you didn't do that that's a natural consequence you're just going to have to be ready, you know, be a bit more ready than those who took the time to to look at it ahead of time. So I try to not like punish people, <laughs> but you know, sometimes those tactics work. <laughs> yeah. And there are a few other, you know, great suggestions about make, you know, doing your best more or less to to market or explain the mm -hmm. the importance of this such. Um, you know, we have kind of one of the buzz phrases in our industry in the last while was the flip classroom, right? The idea that you mm -hmm. Do a lot of prep so that when you're actually are together that's more application you know related sort of things etc um but gosh you, you've got the flip classroom model but it's awful hard when people are just flipping off the flip classroom <laughs> model to begin with right <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's reminding them of that like mm -hmm. why are we doing yeah. the yeah. Flip classroom? it's actually to save you time so mm -hmm. do we want to continue this approach or do we want to go back to all being here for you know hours on end you know maybe they yeah. forgot <laughs> we'll we, we'll now begin with a reading from the reading <laughs> from the readings you were supposed to do <laughs> so we will read it to you and we will read it much slower than you could have read it on your own just to torture you <laughs> oh i love it yeah. Oh man. Okay. So, um, I, w another one that you guys talk about is providing versatility to the facilitators. And that one kind of caught my eye as well, because how, how does an instructional designer do that? Right? Like what, what would be some good examples of providing some versatility for folks? Well, I, I'll take that. Uh, I, I think, let me first start off by saying this. I, I've, I've experienced uh, great instructional design, uh, and I've experienced learning design that was lacking a little bit, uh, to, to say it kindly. Uh, and you know, with, with some some products that I've seen, uh, instructional design products I've seen, they've been very rigid, meaning the the exercise activities were geared for a certain participant level or number of participants uh, the, the design was was with one learning space that that was in mind and, and 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 the truth is you know when we're delivering learning solutions you, you want to have the ability to deliver them literally anywhere whether it's in a small room a, a large auditorium uh, virtually and, and and oftentimes you know when you have those rigid instructional designs, uh, your learning solutions may not come off the way that you intended. Uh, so I, I think an instructional designer, you know, needs to think of where the the solution will be delivered. And I think one of the ways that that uh, instructional design can be successful uh, is observing the learning spaces. Uh, so uh, it. 
you may need again to get away from your desk and and, and go out and and yeah. visit different environments. Um, I can think of some some learning solutions that I had to deliver indoors, and then I may have to go outdoors to mm -hmm. deliver it to another group, which is a totally different learning experience. So, you know, indoors I can use visuals, I can use a PowerPoint, but outdoors. I got to do something different. <laughs> so um, I think one of the questions uh, that would help an instructional designer out is, who am I missing? Uh, and, and constantly asking yourself that question through your design. You know, uh, you know, think of all of the different types of learners and learning environments you're going to deliver in. Nikki? Yeah, I was going to to share that. I think as designers, we want to challenge ourselves again to like think outside of the box rather than that that can't be done and i encourage a, a lot of my instructional design students to do that because they may come in saying that can't be a virtual session i'll go well why well we've always done it in the classroom because they have to have the the real play conversations okay so what is the outcome of that real play conversation well, they have to practice, you know, going through the questions or whatever it may be. Okay, so what would it look like? Let's just say if it was virtual. And I think we all need to use the experience of, you know, what we went through with um, changing many of our programs when we went through pandemic times to virtual. Would you have ever done that? In many instances, probably not, but we did. So now let's take that lens of, how can we make them more adaptable for you know virtual face-to-face e-learning because if we go in thinking okay well what is the method i'm going to use okay it's gonna be a discussion that can go into all of these situations and to daryl's point it could go outside you know in the um uh, you know in the free space it could be online in an online asynchronous platform the discussion could be in the virtual synchronous so i think focus more on the method of the active ingredient of learning rather than i want to use this cool flashy tool or um i haven't tried this because i think we get caught up sometimes as designers like oh i have this new thing <laughs> and this shiny bright object and it's like is that the best intent and um if we keep it back to basics, I think it helps it be more versatile as well. Mm. J Rock says we still have Zoom meetings at the office, even though we are all back in our <laughs> cubicles. And I'm I'm envisioning this this room of cubicles. Everybody's on the exact same Zoom meeting, but yet they're all right next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That'd, that'd make a good cartoon. Somebody's got to draw that. Yeah. <laughs> even the even the small differences. Um you know, what we do here um, at, at Domino with, with client training is we typically have the client team provide the meeting tool and that way they can capture the recordings and they've got, you know, that for, for moving forward. Um, so even the subtle differences between those kinds of different mm -hmm. platforms, where the buttons mm -hmm. are, et cetera. And mm -hmm. then, um, and uh, this is fresh in my mind because it was mm -hmm. just last week uh, that I was involved with it, but, you know, a client team that for organizational reasons isn't allowed to have the chat on in, in that meeting tool. Mm -hmm. and. You're, I'm habituated to using the chat as part of the feedback okay. loop and, you, you know, the communication yeah. process and suddenly, oh, that's not there, you know, so mm -hmm. um, presuming certain things that are always going to be there uh, and the universality, universality of that. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. we have to be nimble. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you guys and you guys make adjustments on the fly because you're experienced facilitators. But yeah, having instructional designers think about it ahead of time and offer up mm -hmm. those suggestions or um you know, doing instructional design, like maybe it's two documents even, you know, and then then everybody starts to question, okay, you know, why? Like, do you do one full, fully designed course if it's in a classroom? And then do you design that exact same course, do a design doc for the virtual version? Because some things are pretty different when you're doing it virtually. Mm -hmm. I know we've I know we've got some virtual trainer experts here in the chat today too. Mm -hmm. And so as instructional designers, though, do we, you know, how, how does that work? 
you know, it's, mm-hmm. and, and how do you know when you should do both as opposed to just one? I mean, obviously, I guess if people say, no, it's this course is absolutely going to always be in the classroom. OK, fine. We won't waste our time with the virtual instructor led. But mm-hmm. um, it, it's starting to feel to me like it's going to be more common that it's going to flop back and forth. You know, well, hey, Brent, you see some of the comments coming in already uh, in, in chat uh, where where people are calling for, hey, you need to take two different approaches. I, I think we have that debate here at ATD. <laughs> I know Nikki and I have had that debate and uh, mm-hmm. the projects that we work on. And, and I think one of the, the things is you know, engagement is is a, a, a key focus. And engagement in the virtual environment is, is slightly different than what it is in the in-person mm-hmm. environment. So that may lead, lead an instructional designer to say, hey, I need to do separate designs for, for each of those modalities. So mm-hmm. um, uh, again, uh, I think one of the benefits you have is uh, that a, a lot of what you do in, in person can translate to what you'll do in virtual. So it, mm-hmm. although you're doing separate designs, it's not going to be mm-hmm. you know, totally different. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But again, you want to be mindful of the engagement techniques that you're using mm-hmm. in the virtual environment. They're a lot different uh, that, than what you're doing in the in-person. Yeah. And I think we do, we do that, um, Eddie. I mean, our best practice I, is really what everyone I think is echoing here in the chat is keep it separate, but the learning objectives and the methods I was talking about stay the same, but to set those facilitators up for success what does this activity look like in the classroom and what does it look like in the virtual classroom because there will be slight timing changes there will be slight instruction changes and that um, needs to be i think spelled out for the facilitator rather than just an assumption on the fly because that's all that's a lot of work for the (laughs) the facilitator to go i'm reading a classroom uh you know guide but i'm doing this virtually (laughs) So your brain is yeah. working over time. I, it can't mm-hmm. be done. I've seen it done. I wouldn't suggest it. <laughs> and Ashley's thrown a comment. You know, we have teams that attend training from an HQ location if they live nearby. But if you know they attend it virtually, so now you've got people in oh, front of you plus people, hybrid. you know, on the other side of the microphone and the and and the computer, etc. Too. So having to even bridge that. And holy cow, the 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 uh, the chat is just flying and and, and zipping by faster than faster than I recall it <laughs> happening yes. in a lot of other cases. Folks have some opinions, so uh, mm-hmm. if you um, if you happen to be listening to the audio version of this, uh, this would be a good session to maybe pop into the Crowdcast um, and and check out the actual recording, so you can see the the comments and the chats that uh, that folks are throwing in there for sure. Um, Indeed, and it's absolutely the same link in case anybody's going to ask. The uh, people will often say, "Are you guys recording this?" Actually, just come back to the exact <laughs> same link that you're at right now, and the recording will be here waiting for you. That is one of the beautiful things about Crowdcast. But also, I just realized, holy smokes, we're at the we're at the end of our 45 minutes. But what I would want to ask before we uh, start ringing in the chair dancing and don't leave just yet. Give us a couple, one or two, maybe quick hot tips before we let everybody go that either we missed that we were going to talk about that you think are good ones or something that you want to restate that folks can take away. Nikki, do you want to start? Yeah, I think um, I'm going to go with less is more in in many ways (laughs) Um, with with what you do. And I don't know all the ins and outs of every role that's here in the room, but think about going back to basics in many ways, because um, I think we try to overcomplicate our designs at times, which could lead to confusion, which then leads to poor execution, maybe in the classroom. So sometimes thinking, what is the one question I want? The learners to talk about and what is the main outcome or theme from that discussion that we're looking for can be so much more powerful than trying to make it a three-part activity and do this and that and um, have them get on this website and that so less is more awesome daryl parting parting tips parting tips uh well i i would say you know be willing to take risk uh don't try try not to be rigid uh, in in your instructional design, you, you want your learning solutions to reach as many people as possible. 
um, and needs change based on who you're working on, who we're working with. Uh, so I, I know how, how much time and effort goes into instructional design. It's, it's, it's like you're raising a baby, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> So you, you don't want anybody to make any changes. You don't want anyone to to um, kind of steer you away from what your initial creation was. But I, I think a willingness to be open uh, to allow people to have license to adapt mm -hmm. uh, to the needs that are in front of them and to be nimble uh, to, to make those adjustments is, is, is very important. Uh, you can plan everything on paper to look really good, but then you get into to reality and then everything just instantly changes. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that, that would be my word of advice and tip uh, to share with everyone. Awesome. Nice. Nice. Very good. And I, I would say it's more like birthing a child instead of raising a child. <laughs> Not that I would know or anything. <clears throat> yeah, <same. laughs> uh, I, I've only done one of those two things. So I, I can't, I don't have a comparison <laughs> offer. <laughs> um, it's definitely a good time to wrap this up. Daryl, yeah. thanks so much. Nick, thanks so All much. Right. Awesome. Let's make sure Thank we get another, you. let's drop in another link to the, to the book so we hope folks can find it. And maybe as we close out here, Daryl, you can dance with the books so people have the visual. In mind. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, um, let's do that. Grand. Folks, um, what we do here on Instructional Designers and Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you every week by Domino Learning Systems, makers of Domino One, the team-based collaborative authoring solution. Um, check us out. We'll drop a link in. There's a big green button down below the, the session here, too. Um, and if you're listening to the audio version, you can check us out at domino.com. That's D-O-M-I-N-K-N-O-W.com. Thanks so much, gang, for the chat. It's been an absolutely fabulous session. And holy cow, the words Good stuff. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Into the Wednesday, gang. Don't forget, we have more of these every Wednesday. <laughs>